uh, who's an associate professor of physics and of astronomy at the University of Arizona. Elizabeth earned her PhD from Caltech and held postdocs at the University of Pennsylvania and Caltech, in addition to her time at KIPAC, where she joined us as a Cobley Fellow in 2014. Uh, Elizabeth has won uh, a bewildering number of awards <laughs> that recognize both her scientific achievements um, and also she's quite well known for her leadership in projects like the Dark Energy Survey, uh, DES, and the Rubin Observatory's Dark Energy Science Collaboration. So we are very fortunate to have her joining us here today uh, to talk about more accurate together synergies between cosmic surveys. Take it away. Thank you, Susan, for the uh, kind introduction. And thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to visit again um, and participate in this great celebration. So in this talk, I'd like you uh, to convince you that we need multiple cosmic surveys that share the same page of sky, and that we also need cosmologists with different expertise that share the same building in order to obtain accurate uh, cosmology. Now, as you heard uh, uh, in the um, Mapping the Sky session, we have really exciting times ahead. Uh, Phil and uh, Chiwe talked a lot about Rubin Observatory, uh, what an amazing uh, galaxy imaging machine it will be, and how we'll probe cosmology through weak lensing, galaxy clustering, clusters, strong uh, lensing, uh, and supernovae. You also heard about spectroscopic surveys, where DESI is already uh, acquiring excellent data. Uh, Kimi talked about uh, CMB experiments. And uh, in addition to that, of course, there will also be um, several uh, really exciting NASA missions in the sky. I'm highlighting here um, Spherix, an all-sky uh, low redshift uh, medium resolution uh, survey, uh, and Roman Space Telescope uh, that will uh, focus on medium to high redshift and um, uh, provide exquisite uh, PSF control. Now, all of these surveys are slightly different, and that makes, that's what makes them so strong, because uh, now we can uh, start looking at the synergies uh, between um, pairs of these, or all of them together, in order to really um, enable new types of measurements and achieve more um, understanding of astrophysics and in turn also more accurate cosmology constraints at the end. Now already by itself, each of these surveys will be immensely powerful. Uh, for example, for Rubin, we'll be going from current analysis with uh, tens of millions of data uh, to, to tens of billions of uh, uh, galaxies to tens of, uh, to, to, to tens of billions of galaxies. If we then were complacent and kept our same analyses, in the future, our cosmology constraints might be off because these big surveys by design uh, deliver excellent statistics, but that's not enough. In order to then uh, also uh, obtain ac accurate constraints and get meaningful cosmology results, uh, we need to uh, achieve uh, excellent systematics control. And that typically comes uh, at the cost of um, complex analyses and requires immense understanding of astrophysics. And uh, I like to quote uh, our DES uh, project scientist, Gary Bernstein here uh, with uh, saying that with great statistical power comes great systematic responsibility. That's basically the topic of this talk. So since we need to talk about complex analyses, let me first introduce um, the different observables a bit. Of course, uh, the main quantity that uh, we know, or the main variable that we know from cosmology um, textbooks uh, is the density uh, contrast. And what we're really seeing here is uh, the primordial um, fluctuations uh, seeded by inflation and then amplified by gravity. Of course, this is a great variable for doing calculations, but it's not directly observable. Of course, textbook uh, calculations also ignore a whole lot of astrophysics. Now, with multiple surveys, uh, we will be able uh, to probe a bunch of different tracers of this uh, underlying metadensity field visualized here in the uh, Agora um, uh, simulations by Yuki Omori, a former KIPEC member. And I will introduce uh, these players now in turn. Let's start um, with halos, or more, or more directly observable galaxies, um, where uh, two of the main probes of um, LSST will be um, galaxy clustering. So they will be looking at the statistical distribution of galaxies um, in the sky and uh, interpret them cosmologically. The key ingredient in that uh, is uh, that we now need an accurate model to relate galaxies uh, to meta density. That is, we need to model a galaxy bias or the um, halo galaxy connection. One example of that was work of, from several KIPAC people is shown on top. Uh, that's the reanalysis of a DES cluster, galaxy clustering um, with um, advanced uh, um, galaxy bias models. The next uh, probe um, 
related to Halo's access to galaxies. We, uh, we want to constrain the uh, abundance of the largest bound uh, structures as a function of their mass. In order to do so, one first has to find clusters and then determine their masses. This is a vastly complicated process, um, but uh, a, a KIPEC team has uh, demonstrated really beautiful results with the Weighing the Giants program uh, that has led to some of the benchmark um, cluster cosmology constraints shown at the bottom right. Of course, more work remains to be done, but um, if we can keep this level of um, systematics control, clusters might be one of the most powerful cosmological probes. Next up, uh, galaxy lensing. Uh, Chiwei talked about uh, this uh, and some of the um, um, systematic effects at length. Just to briefly remind you, we start out with uh, light from um, background galaxies, shown in the illustration by Jesse Muir there um, um, on the um, top right of my slide. And then along the path of those light rays, they get deflected by large scale structure, and that uh, deforms the shapes of galaxies. Now, this is a weak effect, and uh, we need to average over a uh, large number of faint galaxies. So this becomes an, ext an extremely challenging measurement. Fortunately, as Chibay sh showed you, uh, we have a branch of brilliant people, including at KIPEC and an LCC at work. So I think this is in good, good hands, but there's a lot to be done. There's also a bunch of astrophysical systematics that goes uh, into this um, calculation. Currently, um, the different surveys measure the amplitude of structure formation, S8, shown in the bottom plot here, to about uh, 5%. Uh, for Rubin, we expect to get um, to about 0.5%. So um, excellent statistics. Uh, all those people that Chibi mentioned will have plenty to do. And while I'm sure the problem is in good hands, I'm glad that uh, nature also um, basically sends us a cross-check. That is, um, uh, as Kimi Wu told us, uh, we can measure the same weak lensing effect, now also imprinted on the cosmic microwave background. Here we're looking for a remapping of the primary anisotropies. Uh, and the uh, lensing reconstruction then um, is based on the statistics of that uh, deflected um, uh, CMB um, um, anisotropies. So um, long story short, uh, this is a completely different measurement technique to probe the same underlying physics. And the uh, two different um, lensing measurements um, also are subject to different astrophysical and observational systematics. One more observable. Um, the zonia effects effects. Uh, that is uh, uh, inverse Compton scattering of CMB photons with ener uh, energetic electrons. And that leads to distortion of the CMB spectrum. On the top right here, um, you now see um, um, visualizations from the lustre simulation showing first the dark matter, and then on the right, the gas with feedback. Uh, and that hot gas really is uh, what we're going to uh, probe uh, with the, the zonia effects. effects. The thermal effect, uh, is the leading effect just from the astrophysical plasma. And then in addition, uh, there's, uh, among others, also the kinetic um, as the effect, uh, where the scattering is now um, uh, induced by a medium that moves uh, relative to the Hubble flow. In total, uh, these effects lead to distortions uh, in the CMB that allow us to measure the integrated pressure uh, and electron distribution. And with that, we can then uh, probe baryons and feedback processes. Uh, the bottom plot here, uh, from the egg calibration shows, shows, shows you uh, measurements of um, the um, KSC uh, temperature as a function of, um, of radius uh, for clusters. And uh, the, um, the lines there that show the best fit profile to the data compared to the theoretical prediction from NFW show you that the gas is more extended than dark matter. Now, those are our different observables. Um, this opens up um, a bunch of uh, opportunities um, if we have multiple probes and multiple surveys. These different um, observables that I just introduced are highly complementary in the measurement techniques, in the example of the two lensing um, uh, measurements, for example, in their astrophysics, and in their dependence um, on cosmology parameters and in their retrofit coverage. So uh, we can then use these complementarities to first check for consistency between different probes and surveys, and uh, that will allow us to um, check whether our model is incomplete, whether we have new physics or just new systematics is then up for debate. I uh, will just detect an inconsistency. And uh, we can use cross correlations between these two uh, surveys, as long as they're on the same part of sky, uh, to calibrate observation astrophysical systematics. And then finally, once we have a consistent model, we can uh, analyze them all together 
and maximize constraining power. So to get a better feel of this, let's talk about how to optimize um, a galaxy survey. In the very old days, one may have said that, well, we want more, just more galaxies, no matter where they are. Then um, as wide field imaging became an opportunity, uh, an option, um, one could say that our main two parameters uh, can be described as area and number density of galaxies, uh, where we've realized that uh, for a lot of late time cosmology, uh, we probably want to um, optimize area uh, before depth because dark energy uh, is uh, inherently a, a late time phenomenon. That uh, was uh, a version that led to the design of some surveys in the past. Nowadays, as we are entering the systematics limited regime, um, number density of galaxies and area only tells a small part of the story. In addition, we really need to consider how well we control uh, the different systematics that go into our analysis. And I've just listed a bunch um, of examples here that uh, people in the room might be working on, but obviously this list is highly incomplete. Uh, let me just uh, show one um, easy direction of this parameter space. In a funding limited case, uh, we're pulled away from all of them. Now, um, I want to focus here on the survey overlap and how that can help us um, uh, with systematics control at relatively minor cost if people have already decided that they want um, multiple surveys. Then um, putting them uh, in overlapping regions of the sky will really have um, um, nonlinear benefits. So uh, if the two surveys overlap, we can cross correlate uh, and um, start um, calibrating pretty much all of the um, observational and astrophysical systematics. In particular today, uh, I want to focus here on the um, case of baryonic feedback modeling and how we can uh, gain from having overlapping um, large scale structure and uh, CMB surveys. My quick work example here uh, is setting up um, a 10, 10 cross two point analysis, thinking about how uh, LSST and SO might combine galaxy clustering, galaxy lensing, uh, CMB lensing, and TSC correlations. And then we quantify um, how much uh, including uh, TSC in the mix can help us to self calibrate the impact of um, baryons um, on all these observables and enable more accurate weak lensing measurements. Of course, for this at the moment, we have to use a toy model uh, because uh, there are no predictions. Uh, no astrophysics that's accurate enough uh, at the moment to do this um, for this quality of data, but at least it allows us uh, to see whether this is something worth exploring more. And uh, just to highlight, no, we don't overcount information in this case. Uh, of course, uh, all the different tracers are highly correlated because they probe the same underlying matter density field. And for that, our postdoc Chao Fang heroically calculated this massive uh, covariance uh, to make sure that um, uh, we are honest in reporting our error bars. Now let's look at uh, what we can get from all this data and uh, different subsets. Uh, on the left here, I show uh, signature, uh, signature noise of different subsets of data versus constraining power. And then you can see different subsets like a three cross two point analysis, six cross two point, including CMB lensing, and then up to including TSC and all the cross correlations on the right. Virtualization is more data gives better constraints. Who would have expected that? Um, but uh, we can dig a bit de deeper. Let's first look at uh, what's still limiting us when we, um, if we have this wonderful overlap between LSST and the uh, CMB survey. Uh, the blue contours here on the right show you uh, uh, what we think uh, the fiducial constraints would be. And then in red, uh, that's the opportunity space uh, if we uh, could learn more about halo and baryon properties, say from additional X-ray um, observations. And then finally, uh, the black contours are the far hypothetically if we could also self cal uh, calibrate all the other systematic parameters like um, intrinsic alignments and galaxy bias from external data. That's probably too fut futuristic, uh, but a good uh, limiting case to have in mind. Now I want to unpack uh, this plot about more data giving better constraints a bit more. For that, um, because we're theorists, we now allowed ourselves to rescale all these analyses and to have the same signal to noise. So uh, we said, let's hypothetically think we have a three cross two point analysis only on fairly large scales, but it gets as much a signal to noise as our um, joint uh, LSST SO analysis. Uh, we would require more than uh, almost um, 1.2 times uh, the full sky. So this is clearly not workable, but uh, it's instructive to understand where information is coming from. 
So in this uh, signature noise rescaled case, we start out um, at fairly low um, constraining power on omega M and S and S8. Then as we include small scale weak lensing, we start to break degeneracies and constrain high low parameters. We add in C and B lensing and cross correlations. We break even more degeneracies. So our um, um, constraining power goes up. If we add in only TSZ in the next step without cross correlations, we primarily add a bunch of extra parameters and lose constraining power in the setup. And then finally, we gain again in constraining power when we include all cross correlations. And uh, there's a, a lot of upward uh, pro, um, possibilities if we can further improve uh, priors on halo parameters, say from X-ray. So the main lesson here is that um, these multi-survey analyses uh, improve parameter constraints beyond the signal to noise expectations because uh, it allows us to uh, break underlying parameter degeneracies and we can uh, constrain parameters that are inaccessible to an individual survey. Right. Now, of course, at the end, our goal is accurate cosmology. In order to get there, we need to do some more work because unlike my first plot of precision versus accuracy, the universe doesn't come with a bullseye. Here we can use uh, multi-survey data to split our data uh, into uh, multiple independent chunks that we can analyze with reasonable constraining power. And you can imagine each of these contours here is just some independent subset of our data. In this case, that looks pretty good. Uh, and we'll probably want to uh, continue our analysis combining these. We might also end up in a situation like this, uh, which should make us pause and realize, hmm, our model must be incomplete. This plot, of course, then doesn't tell us whether we, are, we found new physics or just in a previously unknown systematic. But uh, that's uh, the cross checks uh, that are only possible if we have sufficient data uh, to get multiple of these contours with meaningful constraining power. That's a common technique. Let me just briefly flash here uh, a few uh, examples um, where KIFAC members and others have used this um, on DS data um, recently. An example from a DS year three cross CMB lensing led by Chiki, uh, Chi Wei Shang and Yuki Omori, finding consistency roughly between different splits. Uh, Chun Hao To led the DS year one cluster analysis, where he then split by multiple probes within DS clusters uh, versus three cross two point. That looks good. Um, our grad student Jason Chu at Arizona is doing a reanalysis of DSQ1 across the latest Planck lensing. And in this case, for the first time, really splitting into three cross two point and its proper complement. And that looks great. In DSQ3, we had an unblinding surprise of these orange and blue contours, as seeing that our two splits of the three cross uh, two point data vector for one galaxy sample were not as expected. And uh, that's one example then uh, where this type of diagnostic really led to a lot of follow up work. Yes, of course, no one fits all a recipe, but a few strategies that we can do uh, is now again uh, ask when do these uh, inconsistencies shift or when does the data come, become consistent? Does it help uh, to exclude nonlinear scales that are hardest to model? Um, does the problem um, become better or worse if we change our galaxy or cluster selection? Uh, that may then point to um, uh, the need for additional calibration. For example, we might uh, need um, spectroscopic redshifts to calibrate photosies. We might want to get a low scatter mass proxies or galaxy shapes from space based imaging, as suggested here by this nice comparison of Subaru um, imaging versus HST, where Subaru, of course, at the moment is our closest approximation to what Rubin data will look like. And you can see that galaxies that are separated um, in space based imaging are blended together uh, in Rubin data. Uh, if we haven't planned for that, uh, each of these uh, um, um, follow-ups, of course, will be horribly expensive. So the um, uh, other strategy then is uh, to correlate with other surveys if they are available in the same page of sky. And that will allow us to um, uh, predict cross correlations, check whether those uh, match the measurement, uh, and um, uh, then in turn uh, constrain uncorrelated systematics. And I'm showing here um, one example of how this cross correlation technique might work. Um, um, led by Manu Shan, um, uh, quantifying how well we can um, calibrate galaxy lensing um, shear bias uncertainties. That is uh, our accuracy of measuring, uh, um, inferring a, a shear from shapes uh, for different uh, redshift bins. So uh, going to the right here, those are the highest redshift galaxies where shapes are hardest to measure. And then uh, the uh, blue uh, and um, green curve shows, uh, show you how well SST can do internally. 
and then yellow, orange, and red, uh, how much we gain if we uh, include uh, CMB lensing. And the beautiful news here is that this will really help us uh, to pin down our shear calibration uncertainties at highest redshifts, where galaxies are the most irregular. So to summarize, uh, the next uh, decade will be incredibly exciting for cosmologists and hopefully uh, everyone around them at, uh, at KIPEC will have these fantastic data sets, uh, DESI, Rubin, Simon's Observatory, uh, and um, a bunch of others. Um, as I told you to, uh, today, most cosmology constraints will be systematics limited, but that should not be showstopper. Uh, that just means that we uh, need to work together across uh, specialities to develop accurate systematics modeling. And uh, also having different surveys um, will then allow us to actually make sure that our cosmology is accurate. Uh, we can first identify and understand systematic effects. Uh, and then once that's done and we have a complete model, maximize constraining power. But this program really uh, requires uh, collaboration across surveys and wavelengths. And uh, the planning for analysis uh, frameworks uh, to combine data from all surveys has to happen in advance. That will not just be, now we uh, plug together these two completely incompatible frameworks. And to conclude, uh, I hope I've shown you today how we need all the different data from, to figure out what the universe is actually telling us. Thank you for that fascinating talk. Uh, questions for Elizabeth? You can raise your hand in the room or on Zoom. Oh, that's one right there. I was curious about uh, that one slide where you showed where the red magic uh, sample was obviously out of whack with uh, reality uh, or what we expected, at least. Um, was this the only one that you're listing here that was blinded uh, before the result came out? or and, and what role does that play there? All these were um, results that were um, opened up uh, only uh, at the unblinding stage. All of them. Okay. Interesting. Do you have any thoughts about how these kinds of techniques will need to evolve over the next decade as our data volumes get so much larger? Or do you think they're already what we need? So I've, um, of course, done here, um, focused here on uh, uh, two-point statistics, which is what we've done in the past, in part because it's easy and because we, for example, have fast codes to measure them and the tools to, uh, uh, to interpret them. Uh, we can probably uh, continue that kind of program for a while and just need to add more astrophysics, which of course is not adjust, um, but quite a work program. But if we want to fully utilize uh, this data and use information beyond uh, two point, say using novel statistics, uh, like uh, Sandy and Tom are proposing, or higher order correlation functions, or interpreting data at the field level, then we will definitely need uh, incredibly um, um, developments uh, in computing power, uh, in uh, the inference process itself, uh, and uh, the um, and, and basically coordinated simulation program. Thanks, Elizabeth, for for the both the precision and accuracy of of your talk. It was great, and and I I, I resonate with your message about needing to bring all data together. Um, this is this is a, a bit of a cheeky question. Um, I, I can't help but notice a, a lot of the recent um, cosmology analyses, including those that you have up, the results you have up on the screen, are focusing on showing omega matter and S8, where S8 is a, you know, it's a function of sigma eight and omega matter. Um, quantities that in principle we can measure very well in the redshift zero universe. We, we don't need to, to go out to high redshifts. I'm taking that, it, that this indicates that it's harder to do what we want to do, which is go after dark energy and the nature of dark energy and um, the evolution of the equation of state. We'd be showing those results uh, highlighting them if, if we had them. Would you like to say anything about the additional challenges that come if we want to go after accurate dark energy measurements with these experiments versus what we're doing right now? So at the moment, uh, we are actually still, uh, I think, um, statistics limited uh, to get dark energy, cons uh, get um, the equation of state constraints, say, from DS. 
Um, so that will really need uh, more, more data and uh, larger record coverage from Ruben. But in order to interpret the data then, we really need to um, carefully examine all our understanding of astrophysics and um, acknowledge that probably none of those effects really just scale as a power law and redshift. Because that then uh, really becomes uh, degenerate and contaminating to any dark energy interpretation. Fantastic. Let's thank Elizabeth again.